All right, get your Bibles, everybody. Get your Bibles and turn with me to Exodus chapter 15. Now I wish I was kind of preaching something more patriotic, but um, I'll do that. I think I'm going to do that next year. I'm just going to preach a patriotic message. If God will let me, ooh, I'm going to have fun with it too. Don't come if you're easily offended. All right, so... (laughs) Turn with me to Exodus chapter 15, everybody. Exodus chapter 15. We, we've been, the last couple of weeks, um, the Lord has really led me to talk about miracles. And I believe, I believe God does miracles. I believe God wants to kind of return the church to, to miracles. I, I want you to understand that God is supernatural. We believe in a supernatural God. And if we have faith, what we read all throughout Scripture is when people believed in a supernatural God, they saw supernatural things. And I've, I'm afraid that, that, that we just, how should I say this? I believe God still is a supernatural God who does supernatural things. I believe he even wants to do supernatural things. But what we talked about last week is he needs us to pray and to have faith and even to walk in obedience to him because he does supernatural things in partnership with natural people. Everybody that did a miracle, if you will, all the miracles that we see in the Bible, we said except one, well, creation in the Tower of Babel are the only two that we could find where God did something supernatural that wasn't in somehow conjunction or partnership with a man. And so the, the, the modus operandi is God works with and through people. And so we'll never see God do supernatural things if we don't believe he's a supernatural God. If we don't believe God could even do something supernatural through our prayer or through our faith or through our obedience. And that is really my heart for our church to say, let's believe God. You know what? Here's what I know. If we never believe God for anything, we'll never see anything. But if we believe God for supernatural things, we'll probably see some supernatural things along the way. Will we see everything we want to see? Probably not. But that doesn't change who God is, right? That, that's not what that means. But I want to believe God and I want to see God do incredible things. I know you're with me and that's what we've been talking about. Today I want to talk about healing. Today I want to talk about healing. And so I want you to turn with me to Exodus 15. I'm going to invite you to stand as we read God's Word together. I love for us to honor the Word of God together. Uh, This is my new thing, and I just love it. And I've gotten so much positive feedback from our church saying, Pastor, we love to stand and read the Bible and just honor the Word of God. And I thank you for being that kind of church that is so honoring of the Word of God and wants to, to, to celebrate and honor God. So Exodus 15, here's what's going on. So Exodus 15, this is three days. Everybody say three days. Three days after the children of Israel have crossed over the Red Sea, right? Uh, So three days after they walked across on dry land, and I know uh, there's a lot of debate. uh, Well, there's not a lot of debate, but, you know, some skeptics and critics will say it was impossible for them to cross over one morning because the text says the next day. But it says, you know, anyways, bottom line, if you really study the text, there's no discrepancy. It took them about 24 hours probably to cross over. But we also, God didn't make a trail through the Red Sea. It Probably the division of the Red Sea was probably most theologians say several miles because you have to get, uh, and that's really where the discrepancy comes from. They say, well, it's like a million and a half people or whatever the latest number is, and how could they all get across one morning? Well, it, it, it probably took them a whole 20, you know, God, it starts, you know, on the evening and then the day. So anyways, it, it's a 24-hour period essentially, it, but probably God divided the Red Sea probably several miles wide because you got to remember it had to be, the, the, the gap, if you will, had to be wide enough to get several million people through, but also, or a couple, or a million or so through, but also it had to be wide enough to get the whole army of the Egyptians in there and drown them, you know? So, uh, so anyway, so this is what God does. So, so just imagine Israel three days uh, after they watched that incredible feat where they crossed over on dry ground, right, where God blew the wind, stood the water up. I mean, it's like the first aquarium, you know? They're walking through like, oh, look at the fish, you know? And so um, they have that kind of miracle. Three days later, three days later, they're without water, they come to a place called Mara. There at Mara, there's water, but the water is bitter and they can't drink it. And they begin to murmur against God. Could you imagine being upset with God three days after he delivered you from Egypt and you walk through the Red Sea? 
Here's what I want you to know. You need to understand this. If you're going to let your feelings control your faith, you're always going to struggle. I mean, three days after the Red Sea, they can't find something to drink, and they're like, well, God's just brought it out here to kill us. I have a phrase that I like to use. God hadn't brought me this far to drop me in the grease now. In other words, if God divided the Red Sea just because I'm out of water doesn't mean God's abandoned me. It means God has a plan. Does that make sense? And so this is what they're learning here that we all have to learn. Exodus 15, I'm just going to read two verses. So they're at Mara, the water's bitter, verse 25. And it says, So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. This is Moses. He cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. When he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made a statute and an ordinance for them, and there he tested them. Now, that last sentence is God. In other words, God made a statute. God made an ordinance. God tested them. All right, so that, it goes from Moses to God. You need to understand who it's talking about. Verse 26, and God said, If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God, and do what is right in His sight, give ear to His commandments, and keep all His statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord. Who heals you? I am the Lord who heals you. I call this message, it's really a question I want to answer, and that is, should I believe God heals? Should I believe God heals? And so let's pray together. God, thank you so much for the word of God. Speak to us today. God, I ask that you would give us ears to hear. And Lord, today I pray we wouldn't hear through our experience, but we would just hear through your word today. We would hear by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, give us understanding. Speak to us today, we pray, God. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Amen. And you can be seated. I am the Lord. I am the Lord who heals. Now, there's a lot in this text. I mean, just trying to unpack this text would take you a long, long time if you wanted to study it. You know, if you're into hermeneutics and you like exegeting passages and that kind of, it'd take you a long time. That's my point. But let's just look at the same things in the text. I mean, here we have really an illustrated sermon by God. There's bitter water, and I healed the water, essentially. That's what happened. The water was bitter, and I healed it. Um, I healed it ironically with a tree. <laughs> Why is that ironic? Because that's what a cross is made of. Lots of great symbolism, lots of great things in the text. But look at, look at what he says. This is kind of interesting because when it comes to healing, and, and this is what I understand in healing. And I don't know. There, I mean, we have a very diverse church, and I like that. We come from a, a lot of different places, a lot of different perspectives, uh, even a lot of different doctrinal beliefs or no beliefs at all or wherever we may come from. And when you're talking about healing, I think there is that spectrum. You kind of On one side, you have people that they really don't believe God heals today. It's not that God can't, it's just God, just God really doesn't, whatever the case may be. Um, then you could get, a, you know, on the far other extreme, people say, well, God heals every time. And experientially, you make a lot of arguments about that because you're like, well, I prayed and God didn't heal. So, you know, and so where are we supposed to be? And I think some people through life, disappointment, discouragement, even hurt, just stay away from this issue altogether. Be like, I just, I don't know. God does whatever God does and that's what God does. But is that really how we should live our lives? I don't think so. I think if God's the God of the universe, that's what, you know, the bottom line is, you know what everyone on this planet has in common? Theology. There's not one person living today that doesn't have a theology. What about an atheist? They have a theology. That's, that, that is a theology. They said, we have studied and decided we don't believe there's a God. It's a theology. It's, in fact, to me, it's a whole belief system, right? Um, they're believing in the negative, If you're in this room, the moment God enters into your thought or conversation, you have a theology. So could we responsibly say the God of the universe that we believe in, who is our Savior, is God, but leave anything like, well, I just don't know. To me, I think if we can know, we should endeavor. In fact, really, um, theology, ultimately, if one of the definitions I heard, that I really like is in a class that I took. But it said this is theology is simply faith seeking understanding. 
I like that because I think if we have faith, we should endeavor to seek understanding. Whatever we can understand, wherever we can understand, we, we should. This is why the Bible calls us disciples. That's learners or followers, right? The bottom line is we, we got to do something with this issue of healing. We got to do, like, what does God mean when he says, I am the Lord who heals you? What does, what does the Bible mean when it says, by his stripes we are healed? Is that now? Is that then? Is that spiritual? Is that... Uh, is that physical? Like, wh- what does all this mean? And I think we need to answer that. We also need to answer it for this reason, that if God has provided for us a provision, then, we didn't, th- then here's, what, here's what I know. I can never receive anything I don't believe. That, that essentially, I can't really have faith that God could heal me until I understand whether is that's something God wants to do. Does that make sense? I mean, you know, I mean, I think sometimes in Christian, I think we confuse faith and hope. And a lot of times people, well, I'm hoping God heals me. That means I don't know if God wants to heal. I don't know what God says about him. But if he does, I sure hope he does. You know, if he does, I sure hope he will. If he is, I sure, I sure want him to. That's, that's, that's hope. But when you talk about faith, faith is active. And I'll say this, faith is informed. Faith is not blind. Faith is, I've examined everything I examined, and this is what I believe. It's different than hope. Faith is actually informed. I don't believe God because the Bible says I should believe God. I believe God because when you study science, I believe God when you study philosophy, even when you study art, there's been no person had more impact on the arts than Jesus Christ. I mean, you, you, if you study art, you find Jesus. If you study philosophy, Jesus makes sense. But if you study science, the only, the only working theory that could even work would be that there's a God. And I know that because I studied it. So I have faith today, not because somebody says you should believe in God, and not even just because somebody handed me the Bible. I have faith today because when you go out and you examine everything, the most logical conclusion of all of it is there must be a God. And to me, the most logical conclusion beyond that is because historically, we have historic sources that tell us there's Jesus was crucified. We have historic, uh, history outside of the Bible. Jesus was crucified. He was laid in a tomb. The tomb was empty and his followers believed they saw him. And you can't explain those things scientifically. And you can say, well, anything in the Bible. Anyways, the point is, having examined the evidence, this is the faith I have. I think when it comes to God, you examine and let that examination bring you to faith. Are you with me? So when the Bible talks about healing, what, what is it? In this text, let's get to the text. In this text is a lot. Because a lot of people have questions. I'm going to try to answer as many as I can. One question is, well, does God make people sick? And actually, in this text, when you read this text, you kind of wonder. Because he says, I'm not going to put diseases on you like the diseases of the Egyptians. And you say, well, wait a second. Is God going around making people sick? Because you understand, if God wants people to be sick, we should not pray for people to be healed. Right? I mean, you gotta ask, you got to ask yourself that question. you got to answer that question. And you see places in Scripture where God actually uh, put leprosy. In fact, one, one of the things, that, here's a great question too. Great question is, um, is God mean because God in the Old Testament kills people? This is, this is apologetics, you know, which is to give an answer for your faith. This is one that's out there. God, I wouldn't want to serve your God. He's mean in the Old Testament. He kills innocent babies. And I'd say, wait a second, wait a second. You don't understand the Bible. You don't even understand the people. It is true. There are places like the Canaanites where God said, I want you to kill all living, even the infants. But first of all, you have to understand God can't murder. He's God. He's judge. God doesn't murder. He judges. And the punishment for sin is death. And it's up to, because he's God, he gets to judge when he wants to judge. And when you're talking about the Canaanites, you have hundreds of years, not just of rebellion against God, not just anarchy against God, but you have hundreds of years of savage behavior. And when God says, hey, I want you to kill the Canaanites, then he's not murdering them, he's judging them. And rightfully so, it is a just judgment. 
You understand that? And you say, well, he even killed the babies and the babies are innocent. Actually, to me, that'd be more merciful. Because the Canaanites practiced child sacrifice. The Bible tells us that in multiple places, one being 2 Samuel, that there's an age that under this age, God does not hold you accountable for sin because you don't have the understanding of it. Meaning there's this merciful age. When I grew up, they called it the age of accountability. The age of accountability. The point is, those, those infants, here's God, what God's thinking is, we can dispatch them through the sword and I'll bring them quickly to me or I can leave them there and have their parents have them walk through fire. Now, which is more merciful to you? Not only that, God, because he's judge, has the right to judge to the second, third, and fourth generation according to his word. Right? So a lot of people out there, they, they, um, I, I've found this. Uh, there are some good theologians that are on social media, TikTok, and those type of things, but you need to know the source because a lot of people out there that are on TikTok giving theology like, well, God's so mean. What they've done is they've created an echo chamber, meaning the way social media works is whatever you interact with, it just builds you a little world and you don't get outside views. You just get that little world. And they call it an echo chamber. That's what it actually is because it just builds a worldview around your worldview so you don't ever get any opposing truth or ideas. That's why in our culture, any opposing truth or ideas is apparently hate speech because I just can't handle somebody having a different idea than me. Why? Because I live on social media where everybody thinks exactly like me. No, you have a bubble. You have a little echo chamber. And, and I can tell when people have lived in the echo chamber when I interact with them because they say really stupid things and think they're smart. <laughs> and they'll say stupid things from the Bible, and I'm like, that's the dumbest thing. I, how could you? Oh, that's TikTok. I, yeah, I've seen the video. Yeah. Good on you. So it, to me, if you want to investigate God, it, not that you can't do it on, online, but I'm just saying I don't know that I'd trust everything on, well, I would not trust everything. There's some stupid stuff on, anyways, praise the Lord. The bottom line of this text is that God says, I'm the Lord who heals. So the question is, does, let me ask this, answer this question because it's where I was going. Does God make people sick? There's a couple places in the Old Testament where he did. But you have to understand that was judgment. Even Miriam and Aaron, who were followers of God, because they rebelled against God's authority in Moses and spoke against God's authority, they brought themselves under judgment and God smote them with leprosy. And then Moses prayed and God healed them. But you have to understand, under the old covenant, we're under judgment. So if God wants to make somebody sick, he can. The new covenant's different. God's never made anyone sick under the new covenant. We're going to see it in a minute, but it's because Jesus paid for sickness. Are you with me? So God powerfully, yes, he can make people sick. Does God make people sick today? No. Why does sickness exist, though? Well, let me give you two things really quickly. God doesn't make people sick. I can tell you that, show you that through the Bible. I kind of explained it. We're under a new covenant, especially a covenant of grace. Where our sin has been paid for, and because our sin has been paid for, God doesn't make people sick. He doesn't judge that way. All right. The second thing um, is that sin exists because we're in a fallen world. And if sin exists, then sickness exists because sickness, what, what, say, Adam and Eve sinned, and their sin opened the door for death, right? So sickness and death, all of that disease exist in the world because sin entered the world. There was no sickness in the world when there wasn't sin in the world. There was no disease in the world when there wasn't sin in the world. We see that in the garden. It wasn't like on the eighth day, God made bacteria, germs, sickness, death, and disease. No, everything was good and perfect. Then sin entered the world. Mess. So, so we live in a world 
where because of sin, sickness is in the world. So God, if someone's sick, that doesn't mean God made them sick. No, not at all. God doesn't make people sick. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. But it does mean we're in a fallen world where sickness and sin exist, and we have human bodies that are prone to getting sick. You know, they're weak. They're frail. That's also the fallen nature or the fallen physical state of man. And then also the devil makes people sick. We see that throughout the New Testament. People, I don't believe they'll make people. Well, you didn't read the Bible because many times when Jesus healed someone, he cast a demon out. He even said there was a spirit called the spirit of infirmity. So why are people sick today? It's not because of God. It's because we live in a fallen world and there's a devil. Okay? So let me sum all that up. Does that make sense? So then the bottom line is, well, does God want to heal? Well, here's what's great about this text. God is not just saying, I heal in this text, if you study the Hebrew. This, this text, when he says, I am the Lord who heals, the I am, most people know when he talked to Moses, remember he said, I am that I am, right? And this is the covenantial name for God. This is the holy name for God, Yahweh. It is so holy that Hebrews will not even write the vowels, right? It's so holy, I, I'm not even supposed to say it. You know, it's, it's that holy of a name. It's the covenantial. So what God is actually saying here, what is being expressed here. Um, is he says, I'm the God who heals, and he's saying it is, it is a covenant. This is my covenant I'm making with you that I'm your healer. But, but not only is he saying I heal, but he's saying I am healing. Just like God says, I am love. In this text, you study it. You can go read the Hebrew scholars if you want to, or you can just accept me summing it up for you. What God is actually saying is not just I am the God who will heal you, but what God is saying is it, I am. this is a covenant promise to you that I am healing. I am your healing. Now, this is where it gets a little dicey theologically, so let me explain this. Because God uses Yahweh and Rapha, right? R-A-P-H-A. It's a Hebrew word. We sang it today. Most people understand it's the word in Hebrew for healing. A lot of theologians will say Rapha means God is a physical healer. Some theologians will say Rapha means God is a spiritual healer. And they say, what is, what is the truth then? Is God healing us spiritually or is God heal, healing us physically? Because many people who do not believe in physical healing believe when, when God reveals himself as Jehovah Rapha or Yahweh, the God who heals, I am your healing, Rapha. When God reveals himself that way, many people say, well, he's talking about spiritual healing. He's not talking about physical healing. So we need to know, right? Should I believe God heals? If I'm sick today, I need to know, does God heal preacher or does not God? Should I believe? Should I pray? Should I trust? Because if I believe God's making me sick, I should not pray. If I believe I'm sick because I sinned, I should not pray because ultimately sickness now is my fault. But if I believe God is a healer, I should pray. And I should have faith. So let's go to Isaiah 53 together. Isaiah 53 is a passage. It's messianic, meaning pointing to Jesus some 700 years before Jesus is actually going to be born. And we're going to read Isaiah 53. In verse 5, many know the phrase, by his stripes we are healed, right? Now remember, we're trying to determine, is God a spiritual healer or is he a physical healer? I need to know. And you need to know. So by his stripes we are healed. Pastor, what does that mean? Because it's Rapha again. It's the same Hebrew word, Rapha. And so is God healing us spiritually or is God healing us physically? Well, Isaiah gives us a key. In fact, we can understand it because if we read the context, how many know a, a, a text without a, without a context is a pretext? What does that mean? If I have a presupposition and I just go pick and choose a few words in scriptures, I can almost make the Bible say anything I want it to say. But if I study the context of the text, here's what makes hermeneutics or studying the Bible, here's what makes it a little bit tricky because the author and the writer are two different people. The Bible has one author and 40 writers, and it was written over 1,500 years in various kingdoms and cultures. And so to determine the context, I have to look to and say, well, how did the writer write and what did the author mean? 
Are you with me? So Isaiah is going to help us. Isaiah 53, what does it mean that God's a healer? Well, verse 3, he was despised and rejected. This is now talking about Jesus. This is a messianic prophecy some 700 years before Jesus was born. A man of sorrows acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely, now verse 4 is a key to what Isaiah meant. Surely he has borne our griefs, underlying griefs, and carried our sorrows, underlying sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Now verse 5 is one most everyone knows. But he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we were healed. Pastor, when it says, by his stripes we were healed, were we healed spiritually, meaning we could be restored spiritually to God, or did it mean physically where we could be restored physically by God? What did Isaiah mean? And to me, verse 4 is the key. Many theologians that would argue Rapha solely means spiritual restoration, they would point to the semantic range of the word Rapha used by Isaiah, meaning Isaiah uses the word Rapha seven times in six different verses, and it is true. The majority of those times, I think four to five, four times, um, it is clear, four out of seven is clear that it really is pointing to restoration of the soul or, or the spirit, in other words, spiritual restoration to God. And that's true. That's true. That's the semantic range of how it's used. But what did Isaiah say? Well, look at verse 4 where it says, Surely he has borne our griefs and he carried our sorrows. Well, you say, well, I mean, yeah, that's nice. He bore our griefs, carried our sorrows. Here's the thing. Bottom line, I don't think you can find a Hebrew scholar that will disagree with this because I've read most of them, or a lot of them, not most of them. But that word griefs, Actually, could have, should probably, you could even say should have, but could have been interpreted sickness. In fact, that word for grief in the Hebrew Old Testament is used 24 times. And 20 times it is translated sickness, four times it's translated grief. In other words, Isaiah is saying, Jesus bore our sickness. The word sorrows actually could have just as easily been translated pains. So Isaiah, I understand everything we just talked about, but here's what Isaiah is saying in the context of this verse. Surely Jesus bore our sickness. And surely Jesus carried our pain. And by his stripes we were healed. To me, it becomes even more clear when Matthew uses or quotes this same text in Matthew chapter 8. Um, Matthew was a good Jew. He would, have, you know, he would have been educated to some degree uh, in the Torah. Luke is the only really New Testament writer that wasn't uh, a Jew. Some, well, some say he was a Hellenistic Jew, which means a Greekified Jew, but a lot of people hold to the fact he was a Gentile. But Matthew's writing from a Jewish perspective. And, here's, and so he knows Isaiah 53 is the point. And he says, now look at the context. Look at the context. Matthew 8, 14. Now when Jesus had come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother lying sick with a fever. So he touched her and the fever left her and she arose and she made him something good to eat. Probably something really good. Probably some cake. When evening had come, they brought to him. Now look at this. So what's the context? Well, Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law. And when evening came, they brought him many who were demon-possessed and cast out the spirits with the word. Now look at this. And healed all who were sick. How many did he heal? That it might be fulfilled. Now did it say he forgave all or he healed all? He healed all. 
And Matthew writing says this fulfills something, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, He himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Isn't that interesting? What was the context? Jesus was doing incredible miracles. Right? Healing people. And it says he healed all of those that were brought to him. And Matthew looked at that and he said, Aha! This, now we're talking about a Hebrew. We're talking about a Jew, right? He's a Jew. So Matthew, being a good Jewish boy, being raised, schooled in the Torah, when he sees the Messiah healing all who were physically sick, a light bulb goes off and he said, this is the fulfillment of the prophet Isaiah where he said he would bear our sicknesses. See, the truth of the matter is, truth of the matter is, when it says in Isaiah, we, we saw him or esteemed him smitten by God, right? Smote by God. Struck or stricken by God. What is that symbolic of? Well, that is like humanity being stricken by sin. The point that's being made by Isaiah, you see it throughout the New Testament, is whatever the effect of the strike was, Jesus is the cure for. Say it another way. Whatever the curse causes, Jesus is the cure for. Are you with me? New Testament says that he was hung on a tree. Cursed is he who hung on a tree. By the way, time out, just in case you want to know. This is one of the reasons why we know the disciples were telling the truth about Jesus. Because no, no one, it, it, no Hebrew believed Jesus would hang on a tree because you were cursed if you hang on the tree. And no, no, the Messiah would not be cursed. He would not become a curse. He would not be hang, hanging on a tree. So the fact that they depict him, four gospel writers depict him going to the cross and hanging on a tree tells us they're giving us the truth, not what they wanted. They're not writing to make him the Messiah. They're just telling us what happened. Are you with me? Because anyone that wanted him to be the Messiah would not have talked about him hanging on the tree. Because if you hang on the tree, you are cursed. It is a curse. That's why they said, cursed is he who hangs on the tree. Are you with me? Well, what was that? The curse... That was, that was on humanity because of the fall was placed on Jesus and the effect of that curse. So what we have to understand is when we're talking about what did Jesus pay for? Well, according to Isaiah, if he paid for our sin, he paid for our sickness. If he bore our infirmities, he bore our sicknesses. In other words, that, that as the curse, he paid for everything that the curse put on us, essentially, to remove us from the curse, to free us, to forgive us, to cleanse us. There's a lot of different language, a lot of different pictures throughout Scripture, but essentially the bottom line is, in the atonement, He doesn't just pay for spiritual wholeness, but He pays for physical wholeness. He doesn't just pay for forgiveness, but He pays for restoration. He pays for every effect of sin and the curse. And that is why many times in Scripture you will see forgiveness and healing in the same verse. I'll give you a few. Psalm 103, praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. For he forgives all your sin and heals all your diseases. Isaiah 33, 24, and the inhabitant will not say, I am sick. The people who dwell in it will be forgiven of their iniquity. There he says, iniquity, and do you see that? Sickness and iniquity, same verse. Forgiven of iniquity, and they'll say, I'm not sick. We read Isaiah 53, he's wounded for our transgressions. By his stripes we are healed. 1 Peter 2.24, who himself bore our sins in his own body. On that tree that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. 
It's interesting because now Peter is quoting from Isaiah, but he changes the verb tense. Isaiah says, by his stripes you are healed. Peter says, by his stripes you were healed. Now, let me say this first of all, because some people would use this text and say, well, because he's talking about our sin, he bore our sin in his body, by his stripes you were healed, his point is, by his stripes we were spiritually healed. The problem is the Greek word that he uses for healed it has no inference to anything spiritual. It means to cure or to make well, to heal. So Peter is not talking about a spiritual healing. He's talking about physically cured. Are you, are you with me? But why has he changed the verb tense? Well, Isaiah is 700 or so years before the cross. And so Isaiah is prophetically speaking forward. So he's saying he was wounded for our transgression, bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him by his stripes. We are healed. In other words, Isaiah is saying the, the coming provision for our healing is, is him. He's coming. God is at work even now to bring about the Messiah and ultimately the healing for our bodies. That's what Isaiah is saying. But Peter puts a past tense verb. Why? Because he's standing on this side of the cross. And he's looking back to that, to the cross, and he's saying, you know, he bore sin on our bodies, pointing, right? And then he brings in Isaiah, by whose stripes you were. So what, where are they saying the healing happened? Well, Isaiah is saying the healing will happen at the cross. And Peter is saying the healing did happen at the cross. Where are they saying that health is paid for? Healing's paid for. Healing's provided at the cross. It will be provided at the cross. It was provided at the cross. They're, they're making the case that in this provision of Christ on the cross was not just forgiveness of sins, but healing. In fact, there's this cool account in Matthew, in Mark chapter 2. In Mark chapter 2, many remember this. This is the one where there's a paralyzed man. And um, his friends bring him to a house where Jesus is teaching. Remember this? And they can't get him in the house. So they take him up on the roof and tear the roof off. If you're going to pick friends, by the way, pick you some roof tearing off friends. <laughs> right? When, when you're a designer, we're going to hang out. Look at them and say, hey, would you carry me up on the roof, tear the roof off for me? Would you do, are you that kind of friend or should I look for another? You know, I'm just saying. And by the way, be that kind of friend, you know. Um, but Mark chapter 2, so they, they tear off, they lower the, the paralyzed man down before Jesus. And the Pharisees are there, and Jesus does something crazy. Because he looks at a paralyzed man. His friends had to carry the paralyzed man up on the roof. Because the paralyzed man can't walk. And they had to lower the paralyzed man down through the roof. Right? And they did all of this. Why? Because they wanted Jesus to what? Heal the paralyzed man. And they, after doing all of this, and you could imagine that was quite a thing. Couldn't you? After doing all this, Jesus looks at the paralyzed man and says, your sin is forgiven. Don't you know in that moment they're like, wait, Jesus. <laughs> I know you're tired. I know you've been preaching a lot and you've been doing a good job. Um, maybe we didn't clarify our request to you. But then Jesus knows the moment he says your sins are forgiven, the Pharisees go nuts. And then Jesus says this, immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Now look what Jesus is about to say here. Look what he says. Why are you thinking these things? In other words, saying you shouldn't forgive sin. You don't have the right. You don't have the ability to forgive sin. Look what Jesus says. Which is easier? I'd underline that in my Bible. Which is easier, to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man, by the way, when he uses Son of Man, that's a reference from Daniel. He's actually saying, I'm the Messiah. A lot of people think he's saying Son of Man, like Son of, in other words, I'm just a human, but um, all 
And then they say, well, if he says son of God, he's talking about his divinity. But, but all Jews thought they were sons of God, sons of Abraham, sons of God. So that was normal for them to all think they were sons of God. When he says son of man, he's quoting a messianic title from Daniel. And he's saying the Messiah is the son of man. So when he says son of man, he's saying, I'm the Messiah. Because some people say, well, Jesus never said he was God. He said it all the time. All the time. But every time he says son of man or I am the Son of Man, or as the Son of Man I have, whatever. He's saying, I'm the Messiah. So right away he says, so you know the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins. He said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. And he got up, and he took his mat, and he walked out in full view of them all. I think he was beat bopping. I think he was a little zippity doo dah right there. I just... <laughs> And they were amazed and praised God. And they said, we've never seen anything like this. But look at what Jesus said. Look, look, we're talking about salvation and healing in the same verse. Well, what now we have it in the same sentence in the Messiah's mouth. Which is easier to say your sin is forgiven or get up and walk? Here's what Jesus is saying. They're not different to me. It's not different. I'm the one who forgives, and I'm the one who heals. Not, not different. They're tied up together. In fact, when you look at what Jesus declares from, from Isaiah the prophet in Luke chapter 4, when he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Why? Because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, right? To, to set free the captive, the recovery of sight to the blind, set at liberty the bruised. Well, when you think about that, this is what he's saying that the Messiah does. I came to deal with all the effects of sin. I came to deal with poverty. I came to deal with bondage. I came to deal with blindness. And I came to deal with bruised, which would be oppressed or brokenhearted. That's, that's when I'm damaged on the inside. And so here's what Jesus is saying. I'm the provision for it all. What is Isaiah saying? He's the provision for it all. He was wounded for our transgression, right? That's, that's our trespass or our sin. Our iniquity, that's the inner desires that we have that lead us into sin, the brokenness on the inside, right? The chastisement that brought us peace, right? That, that's actually shalom, meaning wholeness, prosperity, wellness. I mean, Wholeness of mind, wholeness of body, soundness of mind, soundness of body, soundness of life. However you want to put it, that's what that word means. And by his stripes we're healed. That's his so here's, here's, here's what I want you to understand, what Jesus is saying. Hey, I'm paying for it all. I'm paying for it all. People say, well, is it the will of God to heal? Well, how do we determine the will of God? Well, we have to look to the word of God, not our experience. Well, when I look to the Word of God, is it God's will to heal? Well, when He says, I am the Lord, your healer, or I am the Lord, your healing, however you want to put it, I'm the Lord who heals. He's saying, I have the power to heal, I have the nature to heal, I have the desire to heal, or I could say, I have the will to heal. Another way that we can determine the will of God is by looking at Jesus. Jesus was the express image of God. Jesus can't be anything different than God. He can't contradict God. The moment he does, this whole thing falls apart. You understand? That's why Jesus said, I don't do anything unless I see my Father doing it. I don't say anything unless I first hear it from my Father. In other words, he is the exact representation. He is the, the, the 3D imprint of God, if you will, right? So, what do we see in Jesus? We're trying to determine the will of God. Well, let's study Jesus. I mean, we already have God in the Old Testament saying, it's my, I am the Lord who heals. Like, this is my will. This is my nature. This is who I am. I am a healer. Well, what about Jesus? Well, Matthew 4.23, let's just look at Jesus. Matthew 4.23, and Jesus went about Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. And his fame went out through Syria, and they brought him all sick people who were afflicted, with various diseases and torments and those who were demon-possessed, epileptics and paralytics. And he healed them, and you can put in that text, all. Matthew 8, he healed all who were sick. Matthew 9, every sickness that was among them, he healed. Matthew 12, he healed all of those who were brought to him. 
So what's the conclusion then? I'm trying to determine the will of God. Well, I've got Jesus who is God. And here's what I can tell you. You can go study it, and I'd recommend you always study the Bible. But you cannot find one person in the New Testament that was brought to Jesus or that came to Jesus that he did not heal. There's not one time he said, well, it's really not God's will for you, or I'm really not in the mood today. And he is the exact representation of God. So I'm trying to determine, does, should I believe God really heals today? Should I believe God wants to heal? Well, I've got to look at God incarnate and understand that Jesus, I mean, we got a problem. If God's running around making people sick and Jesus is running around healing people, we got a problem. Are you with me? Or if God doesn't want people to be well and Jesus keeps making them well, we have a problem. But look at this. Mark 1.40, it says, Now a leper came to him, employing, kneeling down and saying to him, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus, moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing. Let me say it another way. Then God said to him, Y'all believe Jesus is God? In the text, then God said to him, I am willing. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. You need to understand the covenantal promises of God are based on love and not law. So going back to Exodus 15 in our text, when God says, this is the covenant, essentially it's kind of what he sees, covenantal language, but he's saying, I am your covenant healer. If you stay in covenant with me, I'm, I'm the God who heals. That language doesn't come out of law, it comes out of love. And a lot of times we approach God, even though we're in the covenant of the New Testament, which is solely by grace, and you need to understand that God heals just like he saves, solely by grace. You don't earn it. You can't turn faith into a work. Well, when I get to a certain level of faith, well, who determines what that level is and if you got there or not? And a lot of people, unfortunately, they make, I believe in faith, obviously. It's by grace through faith that you are saved. How are you healed? By grace through faith. So you can't minimize the importance of faith, but I want to make sure you don't make faith a work. Because once you have faith in your faith, you don't have faith in Jesus anymore. And you don't get healed because you have faith in your faith. You get healed because you have faith in His goodness and His grace. Everything in this covenant is about grace. And it's all based on love. For God so loved the world. Why does God save? Because God loves. Why does God heal? Because God loves. Does that mean if I don't receive healing, God doesn't love me? No, not at all. I'm going to get to that in just a minute. But you need to understand the basis is the love of God pours out the grace of God and we believe it. I'm going to say that again. You need, this, is, this is the whole Christian life. It's every promise from God, whatever it is, it's the love of God pouring out the grace of God and you believe it. That's how every promise with God works. You don't have faith in your faith. You don't get good enough, smart enough, strong enough. You don't get better. You don't arm wrestle God into giving you what you want because you finally kept whatever law you thought or your church attendance or your Bible reading or your prayer. No, everything we receive from God is because God is so loving and God is so good and we believe it. Everything we have from God is because God is so loving and God is so good, and we believe it. And today, if I need to be healed, it's the same as if I need to be saved. How could God save me? How could He do that? 
Do you understand the sins I've committed? Do you understand the mistakes that I have made? Do you understand the things that I have done? How could he do that? Because God so loved the world that he gave. And whoever believes, well, how could God heal me today? I'm a mess. Because God so loves the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes, Oh, pastor, that's a great message. That's a good sermon. That's some good preaching. But why do I still get sick or why am I still sick? That's a great question. I guess I could ask it this way. Why do we still sin? Did Jesus Christ pay for sin? Do we still sin? Is it Jesus' will that all should come to repentance, not one should perish, but do people perish? How do we explain that then? Because the will of God is that all would be saved. I'm not willing that any should perish, but all. Well, wait a second. People have perished. Has God given us power over sin? Absolutely. We can read all about it in Romans 6. But do we still sin? Can we explain it? Yes, I can. Write down three words. Penalty, power, and presence. Penalty, power, and presence. Jesus paid for the penalty of sin. Didn't he? Isn't that true? I hope so. Did Jesus pay? The penalty for sin is judgment and death and damnation. Now, did Jesus pay for the penalty of sin? We better hope so. <laughs> If not, we're in trouble. Are you with me? Let me ask you this. Is it true that we'll say after the end, <laughs> right? Eschat- you know, using, you know, eschatologically, that's a lot of words, eschatology. You can put the ologically, but I can't say it. It sounds like I'm speaking in tongues. Somebody won't interpret. It's going to mess the whole service up. <laughs> in terms of eschatology, isn't it true? In other words, after the end, isn't it true? We're delivered from the presence of sin. That's true, isn't it? There's no sin. In, we'll say it this way. Simple terms. No sin in heaven, right? Can we all agree there's no sin in heaven? Whatever heaven looks like to you, whatever your theology is there, we all agree after life. We go to be with Jesus, whether that's here, there, or in the air. We're with Jesus, and we would all agree what? There's no Sin there. So Jesus paid for us to be delivered from the penalty of sin. So we have been delivered from the penalty of sin. Would we agree? Yes. In the sweet by and by, as it were, to quote a hymn from the olden church, right? We will be delivered from the presence of sin. Is everybody with me? So what about right now? Right now, we are being delivered, or you could say overcoming, the power of sin. Paul said it this way, sin's still at work. <laughs> he even said, it's still at work in my body so that when I don't want to do the things that I, that I know that I, that I, that I shouldn't do, I, I do those things and oh, what a wretched man that I am. He said, oh, who could, who could free me from this? But yet the chapter four, he's telling us, should we go on sinning to make grace abound? Certainly not. How can we have been delivered from sin continue any longer in it? In other words, we're supposed to overcome sin by the power of the grace of God, by the power of the blood of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit. So when we're talking about sin, we said God's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. But we know some people perish, they don't come to repentance. When we're talking about sin, we know God delivers us what from the penalty of sin. Jesus paid for the penalty of sin. Jesus pays for the presence of sin. You know that? And right now we're overcoming the power of sin. Well, what about sickness? Well, Jesus paid for the penalty of sickness, death. One day, wouldn't we all agree in heaven, wherever, you know, that I say that because a lot of people disagree on whether heaven's up there or heaven's down here, and, but we all fundamentally understand the same concept. Being with Jesus in eternity, that's heaven. In heaven, is there going to be sickness? Is there going to be sorrow? Is there going to be grief? Is there going to be pain? 
No. So Jesus paid for the penalty of sickness. So we have been delivered from the penalty of sickness, meaning death no longer has a hold on me. Right? I also will be delivered from the presence of sickness, from pain, from suffering, from grief, from sorrow. What about right now? Right now, by His grace, by the Spirit of God, by the blood of Jesus, I'm overcoming the power of sickness. Meaning it's still in this world. Has Jesus paid for it? Yes. Will I encounter it? Most likely. But does the fact that I encounter it mean that God isn't willing, that God doesn't heal, that God doesn't love me? Not at all. Does the fact that I encounter sin mean that God hasn't paid for it, that God doesn't love me, that God will not deliver me? Absolutely not. So what is the conclusion? The conclusion is this. Just as I trust in God and rely on the Spirit of God and the power of God and the blood of Jesus to overcome sin, I trust in God, rely on God, on the blood of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome sickness. And that's why when I am sick, I call on the elders or the leaders of the church and they anoint me with oil and pray for me that the prayer of faith will save the sick and God will raise them up. That's why it's set into the church because James is saying, listen, I know my big brother and he paid for sin and he paid for sickness and if someone is in sin, we pray and we trust and we believe God to deliver them and if someone is sick, we pray and we trust and we believe God to deliver them. Because He is the God who heals. Are you with me today? Can you give Jesus praise today? God is so good. Why don't you stand with me? I know I went a little bit long. I know I say that every week. When we get to heaven, the good news is I'm not a guest speaker. I'm just warming up because in heaven it's all eternity and sometimes I'd like to preach that long. Amen. I'm going to ask our prayer team to come today. and I specifically want us to pray for people who are sick today in their bodies, struggling with pain today. Prayer team, you can go ahead and come. But I, I want us to pray, and I want to pray for you. And then I want, even though I'm going to pray for you, I want you to get prayer today. I, I wanted to tell this story, and I didn't have time, but when I was a, a young boy, a baby, in fact, I was born. I'll give you the one-minute version. My mother noticed immediately I couldn't move my neck. Nothing was ever told her at the hospital. Uh, they were at their church, and a, a missionary was speaking that day. And the missionary prayed for me because my mom said, I don't know what's wrong, but he can't move his head at all. It just lays on his shoulder. Could you pray? And he did. Within a week, I raised my head up, seemed very normal. It wasn't until I played Little League Baseball when I was seven years old that mom really got a birth certificate and paid attention to what was on it. But the doctor had actually made a note on my birth certificate. He was born with uh, partial paralysis of the right side. What we now know is I was born partially paralyzed and God healed me. Kind of crazy, but it happened. And what I want you to know is God healed me just when a pastor prayed. In fact, he prayed twice. They brought me up to the front and he prayed. And then as they were leaving back then, they kind of did like we do here. We'll stand, Jan and I usually stand out in the front and say hi to everybody. And he was standing out. But back then they had vestibules. I don't know what the difference between a vestibule and a lobby and a four-year. All those are, those, those mysteries are too much for me. But anyways, um, they were standing back there. And, and when my parents came by, he said, could I just pray over your son one more time? And they said, yes. And he prayed. And then, and then God did a miracle. He prayed twice. Why? I don't know. All we know, God did a miracle. I'm just saying, if you need prayer, even if you've had prayer, we'd love to pray with you. I believe God still does miracles. I believe God still heals. And so, God, we just thank you today for your grace and your goodness, Lord, for your love. And God, today, I know probably people watching online in this room 
God, probably you're kind of wrestling with some things we talked about because of our experience. And our experience can be a, it, it can just be hard to reconcile sometimes with our faith. But God, I just pray we, we wouldn't get our theology, our faith, our belief in you from our experience. But we would get our faith in you and our belief in you from the word of God. Lord, today I just pray you'd mend broken hearts where they've been devastated or disappointed. And then, God, today I pray where there are those who need healing and miracles in their body, God, I pray you would work and heal. Lord, we've seen you do it in this church. We've seen rotator cuffs mended. We've seen terminal lung disease healed. We've seen heart problems, lifelong heart problems, maladies completely restored. God, we've seen you do it. Lord, today I just pray let the grace of God, that grace of healing rest on the people that need it in this room. And Lord, let us receive it by faith. Lord, that you are the God who heals. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Amen. Can you give Jesus praise today? God is so good. Hey, Pastor Marty here from Pathway Church. I just want to say thank you for joining us. And I want to encourage you to get connected and stay connected. And there's several ways you can do that. Number one, you can download the Pathway app and we are all the time offering resources and information on that app for you. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you do, make sure you click the bell so that you never miss any life-giving and life-changing content as we add it to the channel. And then also, uh, make sure you follow us on social media, on Instagram, on Facebook. Look. Our hope and heart for you is that you walk in the purpose for which God made and created and redeemed you for. We love to connect people to purpose. We thank you for giving us this opportunity. And if you're ever in Longview or you are in Longview, I'd love to invite you to join us in person each weekend. Listen, I pray God's best for your life. I believe if you follow Jesus, your best is ahead.